Today, we're continuing our series of seeing what happened to each of the top 10 picks of every draft class. In today's video, we're going to tackle the 2001 class. Out of 57 players drafted in this class, 49 of them would play in an official NBA game. And unlike the 2000 class that only saw three All-Stars, eight would be named All-Stars in this group. However, out of those eight All-Stars, only three of them would be selected in the top 10. Now, we're going to start it off today with potentially one of the biggest busts in recent history. While we know the player that Kwame Brown would develop into in the NBA. Coming into the league, many thought that he would be a revolutionary player. He made the jump straight from high school, potentially a choice that would go on to cost him millions of dollars. Leading up to the draft, scouts could not find many flaws in his game. He ran the floor well, especially for a player of his size, could jump out of the gym, was a great playmaker, and a very talented rim protector. Due to him only being months removed from high school, there were obviously some concerns on if he would be strong enough to control the paint like he did against the kids his age. The Washington Wizards, though, did not hesitate to take him with the first overall pick, giving him the chance to receive mentorship from Michael Jordan. But as we know today, Jordan was not always the best teammate, and he would have a negative impact on Brown's career. One of the worst moments between the two would come in a scrimmage during Brown's rookie year, in which Jordan would nearly bring him to tears. Allegedly, things would reach a boiling point when Jordan said, you know what, I'm actually not going to read this. I am going to put it on screen for you guys to read read, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I can uh, say those words without getting demonetized, nor would I like to, but yeah, you get the point. Brown had grown up idolizing Jordan as many did around that time, and hearing this from his childhood hero would nearly bring him to tears. When speaking about the moment, Brown was quoted as saying, it was pretty rough, but that's Michael Jordan. You deal with it. You learn you're a rookie, and you're not going to get calls, but sometimes I felt all alone out there, like I was surrounded by sharks. Whether it was due to the environment around the Wizards team at the time, or if Brown was never meant to thrive in the NBA right out of high school, things would fail to click in his rookie season, with him only starting in 3 out of 57 games that he played in. He shot an abysmal 38.7% from the field, and many were quick to label him as a bust already. He would not do much to help his case through the remaining 3 seasons that he spent in Washington either. Individually, his best season would come in the 2003-2004 to season, where he averaged 10.9 points per game, the only time in his career that he would actually average double-digit points per game. Along with this, he averaged 7.4 rebounds, which would also be a career high up until his retirement. However, as a team, the 2004-2005 season would be his most successful year where Washington would clinch a playoff berth. While the team would make it to the second round of the playoffs after eliminating the Chicago Bulls in six games, the Heat would end their season in a sweep. In this playoff run, Brown would only play in three games and he was suspended for the rest of the year because of philosophical differences. In the offseason, Brown would be traded to the Los Angeles Lakers along with LaRon Profit or Karan Butler and Chucky Atkins. While things didn't work out well with Jordan, many hoped that playing alongside Kobe Bryant would revive Brown's already failing career, but this would not be the case either. Bryant, similar to Jordan, was beyond the point of babysitting young players with potential and waiting for them to develop their games. When speaking about his time with Brown, Bryant was quoted as saying, but like, the game before we traded for Pau, we're playing Detroit and I had 40 points towards the end of the game. This was back when Detroit had Rasheed Wallace, Chauncey Billups, and those guys, so we had no business being in the game. So down the stretch of the game, they put in a box and won. So I'm surrounded by these players, Detroit players, and Kwame is under the basket all by himself, literally like all by himself. So I pass him the ball, he bobbled it, and it goes out of bounds. So we go back to the timeout and I'm upset, right? He goes, I was wide open. Yeah, I know. This is how I'm talking to him. Like during the game, I said, you're going to be open again, Kwame, because Rashid is just totally ignoring you. He said, well, if I'm open, don't throw it to me. I was like, huh? He said, don't throw it to me. I said, why not? He said, well, I'm nervous. If I catch it and he found me, I won't make the free throws. I said, hell no. I go to Phil Jackson. I say, hey, Phil, take him out of the game. He's like, nah, let him figure it out. So we lose the game. I go to the locker room. I'm steaming, steaming, I'm furious. Then finally, I get a call. They said, you know what? We got something that's happening with Pow. I was like, all right, cool. That's what I had to deal with the whole year. It was clear that even this early in his career, Brown's confidence in his game was completely shot, and as we know now, it would never return. Whether it was his time with Jordan or lack of success early on in the league, it was clear that even Kwame himself didn't think much of himself as a basketball player. After a short two and a half season stint with the Lakers, Brown would be a part of a package deal that landed the Lakers' Pau Gasol. The deal sent Brown, Javaris Crittenton, the rights to Aaron McKee, 
the draft rights to Marcus Gasol and two future first round picks to the Memphis Grizzlies for Pau Gasol and a second round pick. After finishing the year with the Grizzlies, Kwame would once again be on the move, this time landing in Detroit on a two year, $8 million deal. He played out the entirety of his contract before signing a one year veteran minimum deal with the Bobcats. Despite showing little to no promise at this point of his career outside of an interior defender, Brown was still able to find some teams willing to take a risk on him. He had a solid season with the Bobcats, serving as the team's starting center in 50 out of 66 games that he played in. However, he was still far from the generational talent that many thought he could have been. After one year with Charlotte, he would sign a one-year deal with the Warriors, where he played in just nine games, and in the final year of his letdown career, he signed with the Philadelphia 76ers. Despite starting in half of the games that he played in, he was only able to muster up 1.9 points per game. Now, since his retirement, Brown has spent time covering the league as an analyst for multiple companies such as ESPN and Fox Sports. The second overall pick in this year's draft class would go on to be a premier defender and one of the eight all-stars from this class. Tyson Chandler is another player from this year's draft class that would make the intimidating jump of joining the NBA straight out of high school. Coming into the draft, scouts would be head over heels for his athletic ability as a seven-footer and his ability to protect the rim, but there were some doubts that he would be able to guard some of the stronger centers in the league, especially this early on in his career. On draft day, he would be selected second overall by the Los Angeles Clippers, but they would quickly trade his draft rights and Brian Skinner to the Chicago Bulls for Elton Brand. He spent his first five seasons with the Bulls where he struggled to break through as a full-time starter. Despite this, he was already showing signs of being an elite blocker and rebounder, averaging 1.4 blocks per game and 7.7 .7 rebounds per game throughout his time with Chicago. In the 2006 offseason, the Bulls would decide to pursue Ben Wallace and in turn traded Chandler to the New Orleans Hornets for P.J. Brown and J.R. Smith. This would pair him up with Chris Paul, leading to one of the top pick-and-roll duos in the league. After his retirement, Chandler would reminisce on the duo saying, I never had a problem with CP because I knew he wants to win. I can ride with anybody that's put in the work like that and challenging you. He has a right to challenge you. Great players are going to do that because he's trying to take it to another level. You want to win. That's like CP's whole thing. Even the little dirty stuff he do or whatever, CP is a competitor. He's one of the best competitors that the game has had. Everybody don't take it the right way. But if you can appreciate a competitor, then you can appreciate the game, then you can appreciate him. He would go on to say, it was a nice connection. We can read each other. It was like playing a video game. Chandler would remain a member of the Hornets for three seasons. However, in the 2009 offseason, he would once again be traded. This time, the deal would send him to the Charlotte Bobcats and in return, the Hornets would receive a Mecca Okafor. He would only remain on the Bobcats for one season before being traded yet again, this time to the Dallas Mavericks. This deal would send Chandler and Alexis Ajinka to the Mavericks, and in return, the Bobcats would receive Eduardo Najera, Matt Carroll, their Eric Dampier trade chip, and cash considerations. While Chandler would only be with the team for a single season in the 2010-11 to season, he would still make the most of it. He started in every game that he played in for the first time in two years, and along with this, it would be the first time that he averaged double-digit points per game since the 2007-8 to season. He played a massive role in the team making the postseason and a deep playoff run. He played incredibly well alongside Dirk Nowitzki, who was never a player that thrived on the defensive end of the ball, whereas Chandler was one of the league's premier defenders. In the playoffs, Dallas would eliminate the Portland Trailblazers in the first rounds in six games, sweep the Los Angeles Lakers in the second round, and get past the Oklahoma City Thunder in just five games before taking on the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals. This was against the big three of LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh, so many around the NBA world believed there was no way that Dallas would be any match for them. Despite this, they would do the impossible and win the series in a hard-fought six game. Throughout the series, Chandler averaged a very respectable 9.7 points, 8.8 .8 rebounds, 1.2 steals, and 1.2 blocks per game, while shooting an elite 59.4% from the field. Despite coming off of a title, Mavericks higher-ups would decide to break up the team's core, leading Chandler to be a part of a three-team trade, sending him to the New York Knicks. His first season with the Knicks would be the best individual season of Chandler's career. He averaged 11.3 points, 9.9 .9 rebounds, and 1.4 blocks per game, while shooting a league-high 67.9% from the field. This would be enough to earn him an All-NBA nod, and he also brought home the Defensive Player of the Year award. The following season saw him average a double double for the first time in his career and earning his sole all-star appearance. After three years with the Knicks, Chandler would return to the Mavericks in the 2014 offseason alongside Raymond Felton in exchange for Shane Larkin, Wayne Ellington, Jose Calderon, Samuel Dallenberg, and two second round picks. While Chandler averaged another double double this season, it would not be enough for Dallas to win another championship with him on the roster as they would lose to the Rockets in five games in the first round. After this season, he would join the Phoenix Suns on a four-year $52 million deal. He would remain 
remain with the team through three seasons before the Suns bought out the final year of his contract early into the season. As an unrestricted free agent, Chandler would sign a one-year deal with the Los Angeles Lakers. After having a disappointing season there, Chandler would sign back with the Suns and then bounce back to the Lakers in the 2018-19 season. In the offseason, he would be traded to the Houston Rockets, where he would finish out his NBA career. Despite being a decent contributor, it was clear that Father Time had finally caught up to Chandler as he was 37 years old in the 2019-20 to season. After retirement, he would return to the Mavericks for a third time, this time as the team's development coach in 2021. The player selected with the third overall pick would potentially go on to be the best player that this class had to offer. Pau Gasol is another player from this class who did not take the traditional route to get to the NBA. However, whereas scouts were a bit skeptical on how the other prospects' games would translate to the NBA, they were very confident in what they saw with Pau Gasol. He played professionally overseas in Spain against grown men for a considerable amount of time before declaring for the draft. Along with this, many were high on his ability to play almost any position on the court, his decision-making, ability to handle the ball, especially for a player of his size, and he was thought of in many circles as the most complete player this class had to offer. While the Atlanta Hawks would select Pau Gasol with a third overall pick, he would quickly be traded to the Memphis Grizzlies along with Brevin Knight and Lorenzen Wright for Sharif Abdul Rahim and the draft rights to Jamal Tinsley. Gasol would quickly prove many of the scouts right in his rookie season, showing that he was already a complete player despite being only 21 years old. He averaged 17.6 points, 8.9 rebounds, 2.7 assists, and 2.1 blocks per game. He would quickly take over as the team's starting power forward, only coming off of the bench in three games games out of the 82 that he played in. This would be more than enough for him to bring home the 2001-2002 Rookie of the Year award, and it was clear that Gasol had a very bright future in front of him. While he would go on to continue improving his game and taking over as the most talented player on the Grizzlies roster, they failed to put enough talent around him for them to make any real noise in the playoffs. The 2005-2006 season, Powell would ascend to stardom as he earned his first All-Star game nod. He was quickly becoming one of the best big men in the league, but only a season and a half later, the Grizzlies would make the tough decision decision to move on from him. This deal sent Gasol in a second round pick to the Los Angeles Lakers and in return the Grizzlies received Kwame Brown, Javaris Crittenton, Aaron McKee, two future first round draft picks, and Marc Gasol. This deal would completely revitalize the Lakers and Gasol would prove to be a perfect running mate alongside Kobe Bryant. In a pre-recorded message played at Gasol's jersey retirement, Kobe was quoted as saying, I don't win those championships without Pau. City of LA doesn't win those two championships without Pau Gasol. We know that, everybody knows that. I look forward to the day when he's there giving his speech at center court. It's going to be an awesome night. In their first season together, the Lakers would make a trip to the NBA Finals. However, they would fall in a hard-fought six-game series against the Boston Celtics. This would clearly leave a very sour taste in the Lakers' mouths, and they would make a big jump over the offseason. Pau made his return to the all-star team after a two-year hiatus. Along with this, Lakers would go on a tear in the playoffs, taking down the Utah Jazz in five games in the first round, the Houston Rockets in seven games in the second round, the Denver Nuggets in six games in the Western Conference Finals, for handily defeating the Orlando Magic in only five games in the NBA Finals. The 2009-2010 season, Kobe and Powell would once again run the league, both making the all-star game. In the postseason, they got past the Oklahoma City Thunder in the first round in six games, swept the Utah Jazz in the second round, took down the Phoenix Suns in six games in the Western Conference Finals before meeting the Boston Celtics once again in the NBA Finals. This time, the Lakers would get the best of the Celtics and exact their revenge in a legendary seven-game series. Powell would have one more all-star appearance in his final four seasons as a member of the Lakers, but as the team's core continued to age, they would not be able to make another trip to the NBA Finals. In the 2014 offseason, he would decide to sign with the Chicago Bulls in hopes of having a bigger role. He would get exactly what he wanted and made the all-star game in both of his seasons in Chicago, but with LeBron James in the same conference, they were unable to make any especially deep playoff runs. After his contract expired in Chicago, he would sign a two-year deal with the San Antonio Spurs. In his first season in San Antonio, Gasol was now 36 years old and understandably beginning to regress a little bit. This would lead to him relinquishing his role as a full-time starter. Around mid-season of his third season with the Spurs, Gasol would have his contract bought out and he would sign with the Milwaukee Bucks to close out what would be the final season of his career. Due to a foot injury, he would miss the entirety of the 2019 to 20 season and call it a career right there. After retirement, Gasol now serves as a UNICEF ambassador and a member of the IOC Athletes Commission. Up next is another player that likely would have benefited from not declaring for the draft straight out of high school. Coming into the draft, many thought that Eddie Curry was the future of the traditional skill set at the center position. He was earning constant comparisons to Shaquille O'Neal and even earned the nickname Baby Shaq. He was constantly playing through double and triple teams in high school and 
even that was not enough to stop him. However, similar to Shaq, there were some major concerns about his weight and if he was 100% committed to the game. Despite this, the Chicago Bulls selected him with the fourth overall pick in the 2001 draft. He would remain with the Bulls throughout his first four years of his career, his best season with the team coming in the 2004 to 2005 season, where he averaged 16.1 points and 5.4 rebounds per game. Despite this, it would not be enough for the Bulls to keep him around. Trading him, Antonio Davis, and a 2007 first round pick for Jermaine Jackson, Mike Sweetney, Tim Thomas, two first round picks, and two second round picks. Curry would get off to a hot start during his first three seasons of his stint in New York. His best season coming in the 2006 to 2007 season, where he averaged 19.5 points and seven rebounds per game. However, after the 2007 to 2008 season, it would be the beginning of the end for his NBA career. He showed up to camp following the season very overweight and the farthest thing from basketball shape. As a result of this, he failed to make the cut for head coach Mike D'Antoni's rotation and only played in three games the entire season, despite starting in 58 of the 59 games that he played the year prior. Potentially due to his weight, Curry would only clock seven appearances the next season as he was battling a knee injury. Curry then missed the entirety of the 2010-11 to season. However, he would finally get off the team in a trade that would give the Knicks enough cap relief to make a blockbuster deal for Carmelo Anthony. Shortly after that trade was finalized, Timberwolves would buy out his contract and he would become an unrestricted free agent. Despite this, he would sit in free agency until midway through the following season, where he would eventually sign with the Miami Heat. Curry did not play a major role on this team by any means and did not clock any minutes in the playoffs. However, he would still earn a championship ring as Miami took down the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA Finals that year. In the offseason, he would sign with the San Antonio Spurs. However, he failed to make the final roster and would end up being claimed by the Dallas Mavericks. He participated in two games in what would be his final season in the league. After his retirement, he would settle down in Texas, building a family of six children and committed himself to helping others. The fifth overall pick would go on to be one of the most electric players of the entire draft class. Coming into the draft, Jason Richardson was fresh off an all-conference selection. Scouts were very high on his scoring and athletic ability, and he was a very skilled perimeter defender. While there were not too many gripes about his game, many felt as if he didn't really have the potential to be a franchise-changing player. Richardson's best individual season in his six seasons with the Warriors would come in the 2005-2006 season, where he set a career high in points per game with 23.2. He would also play a crucial role in the historic, we believe, Warriors roster that defied the odds. Heading into the season, Golden State had missed the postseason in the past 12 seasons. However, they would sneak into the playoffs as the 8th seed. As expected, no one had any hope in them, and it appeared to be such a lopsided matchup against the first seed in the Western Conference, the reigning MVP in Dirk Nowitzki. But Richardson and the Warriors would do the impossible and win the series in 6 games. However, reality would set in in the second round, and they were eliminated by the Utah Jazz in just 5 games. In the offseason, Richardson would be moved from the team, along with the draft rights to Jamario Davidson, to the Charlotte Bobcats for the draft rights of Brandon Wright. This was a terrible Bobcats roster, and Richardson was free to shoot at will. Midway through the 2008 to 2009 season, he was traded to a contending Phoenix Suns team. The deal sent Richardson, Jared Dudley, and a second round pick to Phoenix for Boris Diaw, Raja Bell, and Sean Singletary. This would give the Suns an elite backcourt duo of Steve Nash and Jason Richardson. While Richardson once again played very well, it was not enough to take the Suns contenders, and after two and a half seasons with the team, he would once again be traded, this time to the Orlando Magic. The deal sent Richardson, Hito Turkoglu, and Earl Clark to the Magic, and in return the Suns received Vince Carter, Marcin Gortat, Mikhail Petras, first round pick, and cash consideration. With Richardson beginning to show signs of aging and losing his once notorious athleticism, he would begin to take a step back as a member of the Magic. However, he was still a very serviceable starting shooting guard. After finishing out the 2011-12 season, he would be traded to the Philadelphia 76ers in a blockbuster deal surrounding Dwight Howard joining the LA Lakers. Richardson was still averaging around 10 points a game in Philadelphia, however he would suffer a knee injury that allowed him to play in just 33 games in the 2012-13 season and miss the entirety of the final year. When he made a return in what would be his final season, Richardson began to be forced into a bench role for the first time in three seasons. At the conclusion of the season, he chose to make the graceful exit from the league, mainly due to his injury. In 2021, Richardson made his return to basketball, joining the Big 3 League as a member of Tri state where he began playing at an MVP level. Last season, he averaged 16.0 points, 8.7 rebounds, and 2.4 assists per game, along with having the third most steals in the league. The number six pick in the 2001 NBA draft was an elite three-point shooter. 
Shane Battier entered the NBA coming off of an NCAA title at Duke. Scouts were very high on his outside shot and his team first mindset. However, there were definitely some questions if he was athletic enough to keep up in the NBA. The Memphis Grizzlies did not hesitate to add him to their roster with the sixth overall pick, and he would immediately show that he was ready for the pros, starting in every game that he played in in his rookie year. He averaged what would go on to be career high in points, rebounds, assists, and steals per game with 14.4, 5.4, 2.8, and 1.6 respectively. This was enough for him to be named to the all-rookie team. While this season would go on to be the best statistically of his career, he would learn to take a step back for the team's success. While the Grizzlies would consistently make the playoffs towards the tail end of his five-year stint with the team, they would fall short of winning a single game in their three playoff appearances. In the 2006 offseason, the Grizzlies would decide to move on from Battier, trading him to the Houston Rockets for Stromile Swift and draft rights to Rudy Gay. Despite taking over a near full-time role with the Rockets, he would still not see much of a statistical improvement and served mainly as a spot-up shooter and an elite defender. He would spend four and a half seasons in Houston before he would be traded back to Memphis, trading him and Ish Smith to the Houston Rockets for Hashim Thabit, Damari Carroll, and a future first-round pick. After finishing out the 2010-11 season coming off of the bench for the Grizzlies, Battier would sign with the Miami Heat, who were fresh off of a loss to the Dallas Mavericks in the previous year's NBA Finals. He would take a reduced role with the Heat, mainly coming off of the bench. However, it was for the greater good, and he served an essential role of spacing the floor. In his first two years with the Heat, they would win back-to-back -back titles, the first over Oklahoma City and the second over San Antonio. The 2013-14 season would be his last in the league, but he was still a very serviceable rotation player and even spent 56 games as a starter that year. His elite three ball is something that would never leave him. However, after falling to the Spurs in the finals, he would choose to call it a career. After retirement, he would focus his efforts in the Battier Take Charge Foundation. Despite showing promise early in his career, the seventh overall pick would end up having his NBA career tragically cut short. Eddie Griffin entered the draft coming off of an all-conference season at Seton Hall. Scouts viewed him as a future superstar comparing him to Tim Duncan. He possessed a solid outside shot for a big man in this era, was an elite rebounder, and a great defender as well. However, there was some concern about his ball handling abilities, and he had some character issues due to altercations with teammates in the past. Despite this, the Houston Rockets did not hesitate to trade for him after the New Jersey Nets selected him with the seventh overall pick. The deal sent Griffin to the Rockets, and the Nets would receive Richard Jefferson, Jason Collins, and Brandon Armstrong. Griffin had a promising rookie season where he averaged 8.8 .8 points, 5.7 rebounds, and 1.8 blocks per game. However, he struggled to break into the starting rotation. Despite this, he would still make the all-rookie team. In the following season, he started in all but 11 of 77 games that he played in, but his stats still remained stagnant. Things would begin to go wrong for him as he was forced to miss the entirety of the 2003-2004 season due to him entering himself into rehab for substance abuse. Following his time away from the game, Griffin would get a change in scenery with the Minnesota Timberwolves, however, he failed to start in any of the 70 games that he played in. Things would soon begin to look up for him as he started in 27 games in the 2005-2006 season, but he would see sharp declines in all major statistics outside of blocks where he averaged an impressive 2.1 per game. In March of 2006, Griffin would see off-court issues again, get in the way of his career. He allegedly got into a car crash while intoxicated and watching a pornographic film while behind the wheel. While no one at the time knew it, the 2006-2007 to season would be the final of Griffin's career in the NBA. He played in only 13 games, being a non-factor for the Timberwolves. Tragically, in August of 2007, Griffin would be in another car accident, this time costing him his life. He allegedly ignored railroad crossing signs before running into a moving train that was carrying flammable substances. The crash caused his vehicle to catch on fire and the plastic granules fueling the flames. Griffin would tragically lose his life in this incident, and due to the fire, dental records had to be used to identify him. Examiners determined that he was over three times the legal limit for alcohol in Texas at the time of the crash. He had hoped to begin a flourishing career in basketball overseas in the following season, and left a three-year-old daughter behind him. Up next is another player that would have benefited by spending some time playing in college. Zagna Giop was another player who made the jump right from high school to the NBA. Scouts viewed him as an elite interior defender who blocked shots extremely well in college. In the 2005 offseason, he would sign with the Dallas Mavericks where he would start in a career-high 
45 games. He would set a career high in blocks per game with 1.8 this season, but he still struggled to play a major role. He saw a reduced role in the following season, and midway through the 2007-2008 season, he was dealt to the New Jersey Nets alongside Keith Van Horn, Devin Harris, Trenton Hassell, Maurice Ager, two first-round picks, and cash considerations in exchange for Jason Kidd, Malik Allen, and Antoine Wright. He would finish out the year with the Nets before signing back with the Mavericks in free agency, but they would once again trade him midway through the 2008-2009 season, this time to the Charlotte Bobcats. The deal sent Giobe to Charlotte for Matt Carroll and Ryan Hollins. He would play the remaining five years with the Bobcats where he would serve as an end-of-the-bench player, earning starting role in only 11 out of the 133 games that he played in. After retirement, Giobe would be begin a career in coaching starting off in the G League and his most recent job coming as an assistant coach for the Houston Rockets in 2020. The next player had a very short-lived career having nearly the same number of years in the league and teams played for. Rodney White entered the 2001 draft coming off of an all-conference season at Charlotte. Scouts believe that he was an extremely versatile player who could guard any position. Along with this, he had a great handle and a very solid jump shot as well. The Detroit Pistons would pick him with the ninth overall pick, a choice that would go on to haunt the franchise with future all-star caliber players still on the board. White would go on to only play in 16 games in his rookie season, struggling in almost every facet of the game. In the offseason, he would be dealt to the Denver Nuggets. The deal sent White to the Nuggets for Menk Batir, Don Reed, and a first-round pick. Despite seeing a bigger role in Denver, even starting in 19 games in his first year with the team, White's lack of effort on the defensive end would ultimately lead to his opportunities being squandered. He would once again be traded midway through his third season with the Nuggets, this time being traded to the Golden State Warriors. White and Nikolos Kitsvili would be sent to Golden State for Eduardo Najera, Luis Flores, and a future first-round pick. He finished out the year with Golden State playing only 16 games, however, it would be the last time that he saw an NBA court. After retirement from the NBA, he would have a successful basketball career overseas, spending his time from 2005 to 2013 playing in various European, Spanish, Puerto Rican, and Filipino leagues. Rounding out the top 10 is a player who spent nearly two decades in the league. Joe Johnson is the definition of a bucket. He came into the draft coming off back-to-back all-conference selections. Scouts were in love with his abilities to handle the ball very well and play like a guard despite being 6'7". He had elite passing vision and an incredible ability to score. However, there were some worries that he was too slim for the small forward position in the NBA. The Boston Celtics selected him with the 10th overall pick, and despite getting off to a relatively good start in his rookie year, he would be traded midway through it to the Phoenix Suns. Johnson along with Randy Brown, Milt Palacio, and a first round pick were sent to the Suns for Tony Delk and Rodney Rogers. Johnson would finish out the season with the Suns and work his way up the rotation throughout the next three years with the team. In the 2005 offseason, Johnson would be dealt to the Atlanta Hawks in a sign and trade that sent Boris Diaw and two first round picks for Johnson. He would come into his own on the Hawks, seeing a substantial statistical spike in his first year in Atlanta and would go on to make the All-Star game the remaining six seasons that he spent with the team. His best year would come in the 2006 to 2007 season where he averaged 25 points per game which would be a career high, 4.2 rebounds, 4.4 assists, and 1.1 steals per game while shooting an elite 47.1% from the field and 38.1% from three. While Johnson ascended into stardom during his stint with the Hawks, it would not translate into any deep playoff runs for them. In the 2012-13 season, Johnson would once again be traded this time to the Brooklyn Nets for Jordan Farmar, Anthony Morrow, Jordan Williams, Johan Petro, Deshaun Stevenson, and a first round pick. Johnson was 31 years old in his first season with the team and was beginning to show signs of regression. While he was still a very solid scorer, he was beginning to get further and further from the franchise caliber player and perennial all-star that he once was. Despite this, he still pulled out one final all-star year in the 2013-14 season as the Nets beefed up their roster, adding Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett to the team. While many thought this would launch the team into being title contenders, that would not be the case. Once the Nets chose to go into a full-scale rebuild in the 2015-16 season, Johnson would have his contract bought out and he signed a deal with the Miami Heat. Johnson was still a full-time starter even at the age of 34, however after this season, he would begin to embrace a bench role. After this season with the Miami Heat, he would sign with the Utah Jazz, and after a full season with that team, he would sign with the Houston Rockets. As a bench player, Johnson was able to focus more on scoring and being a spark off the bench along with a mentor for younger players. 
Following the 2017 to 18 season, with Johnson being now 36 years old, many believe that it would be his last NBA game. He spent the following three years playing in the Big Three League. However, due to COVID running through the Boston Celtics team, they were extremely short-handed and desperate for capable players to fill some roster spots. As a result of this, Johnson was given the opportunity to end his career where it all began. He signed a 10-day contract with the team, and despite only playing in one game for two minutes, he hit the sole jumper that he took. Along with this, it was also the longest gap a player has had between playing with the same team, being 19 years and 308 days since his final game that he played with Boston in his rookie season. Since retirement, he has rejoined the Big Three and has done everything he can to help his son make it to the NBA as well. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure as always to check out some of my others and let me know if you want this series to continue in the comment section below. Catch you in the next one. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Later.